Uh, all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit distracted. The Twitter feed is not on, but I'll fix that later. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing um, Hope you're doing well. Welcome to this um, last edition of um, this first half of um, the year, where 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 I'm very happy to uh, welcome Sergio Pasca, who happens to be actually our first uh, speaker from the West Co West Coast. So I guess our first early bird, uh, 8 a.m. local time. And I, I heard there's some family arrangements going on. I was quite shocked, Sergio, to hear that your seven-year-old son is more willing to watch a cartoon than to follow you live on Twitter. Um, yeah, I guess there, there's still some bit of education to, to do there, or maybe it's a good sign, who knows. <laughs> so great to have you, and welcome. Um, so a few words on Sergio before I, 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 I give him the, the, the full stage. So Sergio is currently a tenured associate professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Stanford University. Sergio was born in Transylvania, that's in Romania. Uh, and apparently showed that's according to wikipedia but he confirmed it was true he shared an, an early early on an interest in chemistry and set up his first science lab at the age of 11 in the basement of his parents house um, some explosives were involved that's informal and the final year it's quite of an, an important thing apparently because this earned him uh, to win a, a prize in the national chemistry olympiads in romania earning him a scholarship to attend uh, a university of his choice uh, in 2001, uh, Sergio enrolled in the medical school, school at Pluj Napoca, and then uh, at, at this time, as a medical student, he started uh, to investigate biochemical deficits involved in autism spectrum disorders, and did that in parallel with um, with uh, work um, at, uh, in the lab of Dranko Nikolic uh, in Frankfurt at the MPI, where he uh, got acquainted and and worked using electrophysiological approaches. So after obtaining his MD, Sergio went to Stanford University. That was in early 2009 as a postdoctoral fellow with Ricardo Dolmetsch. And at Stanford, he developed methods to derive neurons from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and use these cultures to identify cellular phenotypes associated with a number of brain disorders. So as you uh, are, um, I imagine, all aware, Sergio's lab now is investigating the principles underlying human brain development and uh, misdevelopment, and he's really one of the labs, I guess, together with Madeline Lancaster and Paula Arlotta, who we will have in, in this series uh, in, in the future, uh, one of the, uh, the, the persons who developed some of the initial in-a-dish models um, of disease, um, so-called organoids, um, and in particular um, was one of the first to use assembloids, so to put different parts of the brain together to see what would happen and how that would affect development and wiring. Of course, this uh, prestigious uh, background and and and, um, and and track record uh, earned him a number of uh, prizes. And the one I was personally most impressed with, you have to tell me about it offline, Sergio, is a visionary in medicine and science by the New York Times. So I think that that, that tells a lot about your, your creativity and innovativeness. So Sergio, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, welcome again. And the stage is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Denny. Uh, really, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'll just uh, share the screen and make sure that it's like, this is good. It's all good. You can go ahead. Good. Well, th thank you again. Really, a, a great pleasure to be part of this already so popular uh, seminar series on neuroscience and developmental biology. And um, as Denis was mentioning, I am a physician by training. Uh, my primary interest is actually neurodevelopmental disorders, autism in, uh, in, in particular. And, um, um, and we, in my lab at Stanford, we're trying primarily to uh, understand both how human brain development uh, unveils, but also how uh, dysfunction uh, in disease arises. And I'm sure, uh, most of you would agree that one of the main challenges that we're facing in trying to understand uh, neuropsychiatric disorders um, is lack of access to human brain tissue. And uh, there is no doubt that uh, um, um, many other models, primate models, uh, various rodent models, have been incredibly useful uh, 
uh, and will continue to be very useful at asking questions about development and disease. Uh, but it, uh, there are certain aspects um, of disease, including unique genetic backgrounds, and of course, unique human uh, aspects of human brain development that have been making it quite challenging uh, at times to tackle the biology of disease. And um, uh, by lack of access to human brain tissue, just to clarify that, I mean lack of access at the molecular cellular level in uh, live functional preparations. Um, and uh, this, this has been, of course, a long-term goal uh, of those interested in psychiatric disorders. And I often uh, like to show this painting uh, by one of my favorite pa painting uh, pa painters here hey, on the screen. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. The, the screen is black, uh, at least for me. I don't know if it's the same for the public. OK. Uh, it worked. It worked. It looked good at first, and then it was. Yeah, here you go. This is okay for me. And if you put full, full screen, yes. Oh, this is damn it. It's black. black. Oh, we didn't. We um, didn't uh, realize that. <laughs> let, me, let me then share the whole application. Yeah, the whole desktop. Desktop. Yes. Uh, that will make a difference, hopefully. Is, is this working now? Yeah, that works. It's okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, I was I, I was on this slide, so not that much uh, was missed. Uh, but uh, as you know, going back uh, uh, a couple of thoughts uh, back, one of the challenges in addressing the biology of psychiatric disorders, in my opinion, is really the lack of access to uh, human brain tissue from patients functional human brain tissue from patients at the molecular and cellular level. And as I was mentioning, this has actually been a long-term uh, goal of, for many interested in understanding psychiatric disorders. And I think it's very nicely illustrated, for instance, here by a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, um, where it shows one physician who is like actually shown here with this uh, interesting uh, hat, uh, who uh, was very often moving from uh, one city to another to extract the so-called stone of madness, uh, but it, it essentially try to gain access to the human brain to cure psychiatric uh, disorders. Of course, uh, this uh, was not really working and would very often result in uh, the death of this patient. But I think this again illustrates the fact that to a large extent, the human brain, and especially during development, is inaccessible for direct investigation. Um, and we've learned, of course, a lot about human brain development from various animal models. And we know quite a lot about, especially the early stages uh, of brain development, in particular, for instance, uh, patterning and cell specification. Uh, we also know quite a lot about the generation of cell diversity. Uh, you know, if you were to take the example of the cortex, uh, the initial proliferation, the generation of neurons, the generation of glial cells. Uh, of course, in, when it comes to human brain development, one of the challenges is that it just takes an incredibly long period of time. And so, for instance, just to generate all the neurons in the cortex, you need at least 27 weeks of gestation. And that is just the time when slowly there is a switch towards a generation of glia, which continues not just for the rest of the human gestation up to 40 weeks or so, but continues a, a long period of time after birth. And there's not just a generation of various uh, cell types uh, in the human brain that is, is difficult to uh, uh, see, but also very often, and of course this is almost a rule in development, uh, neurons have to move from the position uh, where they were born, from the location where they were born, um, to very often far away uh, positions in the brain to form circuits. Um, uh, at the same time, neurons have to project very far distances. Um, so for instance, just think for instance, for uh, corticospinal neurons uh, in the layers of the cortex that have to project uh, uh, literally in um, uh, meters away to reach their target uh, and connect with spinal uh, motor neurons. And uh, this is also followed, uh, this migration and this uh, axon pathfinding is also followed by a, a longer period of circuit refinement and plasticity. And so, of course, these are just some of the stages of brain development, but I, I think it's, uh, it's quite clear that uh, many of the stages, um, when it comes to human brain development, it comes to primate development, brain development, have been inaccessible. Um, and uh, what I would uh, like to show you today, what I would like to share with you today, is essentially efforts in my lab uh, in, in trying to recapitulate uh, in 
isolation, obviously not in total, uh, very specific aspects of human uh, brain development, and then trying to apply them for uh, a disease, uh, which again remains one of my uh, main interests. And so uh, what I will do today is actually I will share a, a few stories that are actually unpublished, so I'm very excited to show them uh, here today. But the approach that uh, we're using uh, to tackle this, I think, is best illustrated through uh, the eyes of a patient. Um, and so uh, 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 five years or so ago, soon after I opened my lab here at Stanford, one of my first patients with autism um, sent me a drawing of what uh, the way he thought that we were approaching uh, psychiatric disorders. And I thought this would be very interesting for you to see. He's uh, actually a high functioning patient with autism uh, and uh, a, an accomplished composer, I must say now, which is uh, very proud of. And what he thought we were doing, and I'm paraphrasing him, is what he thought we were doing is we were climbing up a ladder and poking holes in people's brains uh, and then using telescopes uh, that you can see right here uh, to watch uh, both neurons and as you can see here uh, glial cells or astrocytes uh, and of course at that time uh, uh, for those of you who knew the late uh, uh, Ben Barris, uh, Ben was incredibly excited that he uh, even considered uh, astrocytes as, as as part of our uh, endeavors. So of course, uh, this is not the approach that we're using. And so at that time, I called him back uh, and I explained one more time what we're doing. And he sent me another drawing, which uh, I think to a large extent is a quite accurate representation of the type of experiments and the par experimental paradigm that we've been using. And again, to paraphrase him, um, he was saying, with the, what I think you're doing is you're taking skin cells from this uh, patient, doing some mumbo jumbo to the cells to turn them into stem cells. And he knew very well that stem cells have this uh, ability to turn into any other cell types. And so of course we would uh, guide them to become neurons and astrocytes. And really to a large extent, this is the approach that we've been using. And to some extent, uh, well, actually to a large extent, this approach has been successful. Uh, and I'm showing you, for instance, one of our early uh, attempts to derive uh, human neurons from patients. And uh, of course, the process goes by harvesting skin cells or other somatic cells, then reprogramming them uh, into induced pluripotent stem cells uh, using various combinational factors, including the Amanaka factors as various iterations afterwards, and then guiding them uh, to become neurons. And for instance, in this case, you can see one such cortical neuron at relatively early stages of development uh, that is kind of like extending and retracting dendrites. And this is in a case, in a very specific case of autism that is genetically defined in which, for instance, we found that if you depolarize uh, the cells chemically, in this case, but you can also do this electrically, then um, over the span of about two hours, the dendrites of these human neurons would extend if they were derived from controls, which is kind of like what you would expect also based on, on previous rodent studies. But the surprise was that in patient cells, um, instead of seeing an expansion of their dendrites, you will see actually a retraction of those dendrites. And that was, of course, a very exciting uh, finding because it uh, allowed uh, uh, to go uh, much deeper, of course, into the molecular mechanisms and, and uh, of, of this finding. But I think it illustrated how uh, this um, uh, unique cells derived from induced pluripotent stem cells can be used to start asking questions about uh, human biology. And it was like quite apparent very early on as um, I was uh, developing some of this uh, uh, stem cell models of disease that uh, there were a number of challenges in tackling um, uh, in tackling disease uh, really at the cellular level. And th this is how this human stem cell derived neurons look like uh, at the bottom of a dish. And one of the challenges, of course, was just like the cell diversity. Um, very often, uh, many of these uh, conventional uh, monolayer protocols um, are restricted in their diversity. Um, and this is partly related also to how long they can be maintained, which I will get back to it. Uh, but it's also, for instance, very difficult to model uh, the process that I was illustrating earlier, this process of migration from one side uh, of the brain, from one specific niche to another uh, niche. Uh, but probably the most difficult, and that was primarily the motivation for us even developing this col uh, these cultures, uh, uh, three-dimensional cultures, was really the time, the length of time that you can actually maintain these cultures. I think for those who are uh, uh, doing neural differentiation from a stu a human stem cells, you know very well 
that if, you know, through heroic efforts, maybe you can maintain them up to about 100 days. Uh, but after that, the cells start spilling off from the uh, culture. And then obviously at one point they will die off after multiple replatings. And that has been very challenging. It's been challenging because, as I was mentioning earlier, human brain development does take a very long time. And even uh, just to complete cortical genesis, genesis, one would need at least 150, if not more uh, days, uh, which is why in conventional cultures, you would ever, often see cortical genesis stalled at mid-gestation because of this limitation. So a number of years ago, um, uh, we thought about developing a very straight, straightforward um, uh, 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 protocol, well, we, we haven't thought that much. It, it was uh, to a large extent uh, uh, just this attempt of just maintaining them for longer and uh, 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 changing uh, slightly the protocol. And this work was uh, driven uh, primarily by uh, Anka, who was at the time a pediatrics uh, 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 resident, and Stephen Sloan, who was then an MD PhD student here at Stanford, and both of them now have their own labs. But what uh, uh, Anka and Steven essentially did is uh, really, uh, rather than continuing the differentiations in monolayer, they just detached, at that time we were detaching intact colonies of pluripotent stem cells and just moving them to a low attachment plate. Uh, and uh, with just guidance in terms of uh, directing the differentiation, but without any other, uh, neither uh, equipment uh, nor um, uh, special um, uh, matrices, uh, we would see, for instance, the generation uh, of uh, very uh, nice spherical structures, which we call spheroids at that time. I guess now uh, probably a, a more appropriate term would be brain region specific uh, organoids, and I'll, I'll get back to this. Uh, but uh, in the uh, initial uh, uh, protocol that we developed, you would get these beautiful spherical structures. You can see them after about two weeks or so of differentiation. Now, um, again, they're self-limiting uh, in growth, so they grow up to about three millimeters, three to four millimeters, and then they stop. You can see them here uh, compared to a mouse brain at mid-gestation. Um, uh, they have a beautiful site or architecture, as uh, I'm sure many have may have already uh, seen this. Also, in a way, like not necessarily surprising because this could also be seen in conventional monolayer cultures. So this formation of this ventricular-like regions, you can see a lumen here, which we know is not really a real lumen, uh, but then progenitors, in this case, radioglia, arranged uh, orthogonally to that surface. If you start looking a little bit outside of that region, you start seeing intermediate progenitors. And if you look even more, you start seeing, for instance, outer radioglia at later stages. Now, one of the advantages of this method is that it's actually quite scalable because each um, uh, colony can actually become one single spheroid or one single organoid. And so it is not, um, uh, 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 it's, it's quite often that people in the lab, for instance, would maintain uh, hundreds, if not thousands of the spheroids at any given time point and for very long periods of time, as I will show you later. And of course, for me as a neuroscientist, and this was uh, quite important very early on, uh, uh, this uh, cultures uh, are uh, functional. Uh, and for instance, you can see here, uh, and intact imaging of one of this uh, cortical uh, spheroids where you can see a wave of activity starting on one side and, and spreading onto the other side. And this is uh, uh, collaborative work that we've been doing with my colleague here at Stanford, uh, Carl Dyseroth. Um, of course, if you wait for even longer, um, you can start seeing formation of synapses and I'll get back to this as well. Uh, but um, one of the things that was uh, I guess, again, like not necessarily surprising in a way expected was that now that we can maintain them for a very long time, uh, it, we gave the opportunity for these neuroprogenitors uh, to generate uh, more cell diversity, especially when it comes to cell diversity in the cortex. And indeed, uh, we noticed that if you wait, for instance, for up to 140, 150 days, you start seeing remnants of that ventricular zone, but also neurons that um, seem here to be the layer neurons expressing CT2 or other neurons that are generated later in development said be two positive cells, but single cell gene expression, and this is one of the early uh, single cell gene expressions that we've done, uh, showed indeed that there was a generation uh, initially of neurons that were expressing uh, deep layer markers and later on neurons that were expressing, expressing upper layer markers. But this really did take a lot of time. And in this case, uh, it took uh, uh, beyond 20, 22 weeks of, or so. Um, and you can see this quantified here also at the protein level by actually counting cells uh, in multiple lines and uh, uh, across uh, time. But, you know, let me step back for a second uh, 
and put, I guess, like uh, this work into the broader uh, context, uh, because I, I, I know many are probably interested in using these approaches. And, and I, I think it's important to kind of like match the uh, approach and the method to the question uh, uh, moving forward. And so, of course, most of the work that uh, um, we've been doing initially was built on uh, very classic protocols that have been developed in the field uh, uh, that, that show that you can take pluripotent stem cells and guide them in differentiations in, in monolayer uh, into neurons. Um, there have been also in the last 10 years or so approaches that have shown that you can skip some of the stages with high efficiency uh, and with high reliability of deriving neurons. And these were uh, approaches of direct reprogramming from either fibroblast or pluripotent stem cells uh, that were also done uh, here at Stanford by my colleague, uh, Marius Vernick and uh, Tom Sudhoff, um, that showed that you can derive in particular glutamatergic neurons uh, in essentially one step and within weeks. Now, um, maybe uh, eight, seven, eight, uh, nine years ago, uh, some approaches have started to appear that showed that you could actually start these differentiations at neural aggregates. And now I think there are multiple ways of doing this. This is the way I classify uh, these approaches. But one of the earlier approaches, and of course, there are uh, many already uh, in this field that have made really key contributions in particular, starting with Yoshiki Sasai and uh, uh, Flora Vaccarino and then uh, Jurgen um, and Madeline and so on and so forth. But essentially the initial, very often the initial approaches were uh, doing what I like to call 2.5D approaches where you would either start with 3D cultures then at one point suspend them in 3D or you would start uh, uh, vice versa. Uh, you would start with some neural aggregates and then at one point you would play them down. And now in terms of pure 3D approaches that just involve uh, suspension from the beginning, I think there are at least uh, two ways of doing this uh, conceptually to uh, some extent, and then there are many ways in which you can do it technically. And so one approach, which is the one pioneered by uh, Jürgen's uh, lab uh, in Austria, was to uh, uh, use less direction in differentiation um, and uh, obtain a larger cell diversity uh, of cells as it was like later uh, demonstrated. And this of course is very useful when you're interested in generating a very large diversity of cells. Uh, the approach that we've been uh, primarily focused on and primarily driven by our, uh, uh, by our uh, attempts to model disease as I will show you soon, has been to direct the differentiation uh, very early on and strongly uh, to obtain just specific brain regions. And then, of course, if one is interested in studying interactions between brain regions, then do that uh, separately. And this is uh, an approach that also Guo Li Ming and uh, Hong Jung Song and others have been uh, subsequently um, uh, uh, really pushed to the next uh, level. And so, uh, as I was mentioning uh, in, in particular about the directed differentiation approach, that reliability in this process is absolutely essential. Um, and so we've been putting a lot of effort from the beginning in using multiple lines and multiple differentiation experiments to really show the reliability. And I just want to share briefly, just in a minute or two, the work of, uh, say, Jin Yoon in the lab, who for many years now has been differentiating uh, uh, dozens and dozens of lines. Uh, and in one recent experiment that we've published almost, uh, you know, almost, I guess, like two years ago, she has shown that you can take, for instance, 12 human IPS lines and differentiate them in parallel in 85 differentiation experiments and start looking where is the failure rate uh, and how high the reliability is. And of course, when we look very carefully, for instance, at gene expression uh, uh, changes, um, uh, and we've been doing a lot of uh, this work in close collaboration with Dan Geshwin's lab uh, at UCLA, we found actually a surprising level Level of consistency, um, uh, whether the cells were differentiating in various ways, as long as, as they were directed in their differentiation. And I think the best way to illustrate this is actually through single cell gene expression. This was one of our uh, early attempts at looking at this, where you, for instance, can take uh, three uh, or four human IPS lines, differentiate them separately, and then overlap uh, the uh, cell populations. And as you can see, the correlation between differentiating one line in two different phases, a dorsal and a ventral forebrain, it's actually like not very high as you would expect. You get very different populations. But now if you do it with multiple lines uh, it, and, and you guide differentiation towards dorsal forebrain, the correlations are actually above 0.8. Uh, 
Um, and so you don't get, for instance, other population of cells uh, and the proportions, of course, are rather similar. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to this. And now we've been doing this with over uh, 150 lines uh, for hundreds of days uh, uh, each, uh, which, of course, gave us a much better sense. But I think there's not enough time to uh, go into these details. And so how can we use this? So one of the uh, early models for early stages of development that we've been, develop uh, that we've been uh, trying to develop has been to uh, look at environmental insults um, uh, during brain development. And uh, maybe many of you know, but the number of premature, uh, extreme premature birds has been increasing, um, especially in the US, but actually worldwide. And there are about 30,000 extremely premature birds per year. Uh, and by extremely premature birds, I mean very, very early uh, stages of development right before 25 weeks of gestation or so. And one of the challenges with this extreme premature birds is that while we've been getting better and better at keeping this uh, uh, premature babies alive, um, uh, these babies do not have mature lines, uh, nor do they have uh, mature breathing centers. So they very often undergo this repeated episodes of hypoxia that essentially induces what is now called hypoxic encephalopathy or prematurity. And up to 80% of, of, of infants that are born before 25 weeks have actually long-term neurodevelopmental impairments, uh, including uh, that are very often associated with microcephaly. So we wonder whether we could uh, develop a model for this early insult, the environmental insult to the developing brain. And this is work done by uh, Anka during her neonatology uh, fellowship and uh, work that she's pursuing. In, in her own lab. And essentially in this experiment, we just took uh, the cortical uh, organoids at like stages that were resemble uh, those stages of brain development where this insult happens and then expose them to low concentration of oxygen. And it turns out that you do have to expose them to low concentration of oxygen for at least 48 hours to, to induce a robust hypoxic uh, uh, response. Um, and the surprise came when we started looking at the population of cells just by, by, by just doing gene expression broadly. Um, and we noticed that many of the genes that were upregulated were hypoxia related, but many of the genes that were actually downregulated were associated with uh, progenitors, in particular with intermediate progenitors. So you can see, for instance, here, TBR2 was one of the top genes on that list. And so when we started looking more carefully at the population of cells and started quantifying this in uh, defined ventricular regions, uh, what we found is uh, that while the number of, for instance, radioglia paxis positive cells was unchanged after this 48 hours of hypoxia, the number of TBR2 positive cells uh, dropped, which was uh, a kind of an interesting uh, uh, finding. But I think the most interesting part came uh, when we went a little bit deeper and trying to understand what network of genes, what, what group of genes were changing uh, during this hypoxic insult. And we found that not only there are hypoxic genes that were changing, but there was a group of genes that at that time seemed very surprising. And of course, later on, especially through, uh, uh, through the perspective of previous work uh, done by Laurent and Guillain, um, uh, we realized that the unfolded protein response uh, was also uh, upregulated in these cells. And indeed, when you start uh, looking at uh, the TBR2 positive cells, we noticed that they were turning on the unfolded protein response. Um, and uh, uh, if you were to look to use a compound that very specifically restores the unfolded protein response uh, uh, identified by Peter Walter at UCSF through a large uh, screen called ESRIP, we could actually prevent uh, very efficiently uh, this uh, drop in uh, TBR2 positive cells. Um, and we spend a lot of time uh, figuring out what is happening. Actually, the cells are exiting the cell cycle. And so you have essentially a depletion of the pool of progenitors very early on, which could explain um, uh, some, some of the microcephaly in these patients. We also wanted to validate in, in another system, which we, is something that we often do. And so uh, uh, what we did is actually we uh, looked in um, uh, slices of the developing uh, human brain um, at uh, a mid gestation or so, exposed them in a very similar way, uh, uh, optimized the protocol to induce a hypoxic response without uh, killing the cells, and then looked in the ventricular and subventricular zones where we indeed found that the number of radioglia was unchanged, but the number of intermediate progenitors was again decreased, and this could actually be prevented by ESRIP. And I think this illustrates how um, uh, the systems that have uh, the large cell diversity, even of the dorsal forebrain only in this case, can be used to start uh, identifying changes in cell populations after insult. But how about looking at neurons? 
uh, because um, if you start looking at these cultures, for instance, in this case is one of our, I guess, first first scale imaging of this uh, uh, cells, maybe uh, already uh, seven or eight years ago, that shows this flickering in inside these cultures using a calcium indicator. But also uh, by patching, we know that you can patch the cells and obtain um, uh, uh, and, and record, for instance, uh, action potentials. Uh, and we can also do this in slices, which I haven't had the time, but this is like one uh, a, a very exciting work that we've been doing with John Huguenard uh, here at Stanford for many years. Uh, and, and so can you use, uh, for instance, these neurons to start modeling um, uh, neuronal changes uh, in uh, excitability or their properties over time? And so I want to actually share with you uh, uh, an unpublished study, of, of, uh, which is very exciting, has been in the making for quite a long time, uh, uh, that is attempting to model at the cellular level uh, neuronal defects in a syndrome called 22Q1 1.2 deletion syndrome. This is a very common syndrome. It's a large deletion of three megabases on chromosome 22. Um, it's the most common uh, micro deletion in humans, one in 3,000 to one in 4,000 birds. Um, and what is really interesting about this disease beyond, for instance, the multisystemic uh, 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 symptoms that these patients have, which is why the symptoms, is, this syndrome is also known by many other names, Princeton syndrome, the George syndrome, and so on and so forth. Uh, but one of the interesting characteristics from a psychiatric point of view is that, uh, well, these patients may recover for, from some, for instance, of the cardiac uh, 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 defects following uh, surgery or other interventions, up to 40% of these patients end up developing psychosis or a form of schizophrenia. About 30% of them develop autism spectrum disorders. And in fact, almost 90% of all these patients have a neuropsychiatric uh, condition over their lifespan. And that is really, especially if you think about psychosis, where the general population, the rate in the general population is 1%, this actually represents uh, this genetic risk. It's about 30-fold increase in the general population, which is one of the highest that we really know of. So it's really, one could really start looking at it as a possibility of gaining a window of gaining uh, insights into how a psychosis uh, may arise uh, early in development, or what would be the cellular defects associated with perhaps psychosis in patients. And this is work uh, uh, driven by three amazing uh, students, uh, Themasip Khan, who has just uh, graduated uh, together with Omer uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, Aaron Gordon. Um, and I would like to actually guide you through some of, of, of this work, which has been really a, a very interesting journey. So first of all, one of the things that we've been doing is actually uh, for the study, collect a very large cohort of patients. Um, and we've, uh, this is half of the cohort. It's about 30 patients in this uh, study. Uh, but we've actually, for this experiment, we've used about 45 human IPS lines that we've differentiated in cortical dorsal forebrain uh, organoids uh, for up to 150 days or so. And this effort would not have been possible without uh, a really concerted uh, uh, support from a large group of uh, clinicians and scientists uh, who have been collecting uh, and characterizing this cohort over uh, uh, several uh, uh, years uh, now. Um, and um, and this work is, is about to be published, so we'll come online, uh, but I, I still thought it would be interesting to go through these details. And so the first thing that we actually did is we wonder, are there any defects in neural differentiation? So if you just uh, uh, differentiate neurons, uh, cortical neurons, will you actually see a defect? And actually the surprise was that differentiation is uh, very reliable and, and very reproducible across patients and controls. Um, so uh, there are almost essentially no differences in the cell proportions that you would see in the cortical cell proportions uh, over time. And in fact, this can also be seen if you just take intact organoids and you just do RNA-seq, in this case, across 34, 31 uh, human IPS lines across 150 days, you can see that there's almost no separation between patients and controls, which are often gonna be shown here by uh, 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 red, which are patients, and black, which are controls. Um, and this is also to illustrate, for instance, just the sperm correlation between individuals within individuals in both patients and controls, and you can see again that the correlations are really, really high and above 0 0.95, which again uh, uh, told us that uh, there are unlikely any defect in cortical differentiation, uh, but that this would represent an opportunity to start looking at more subtle changes uh, between patients and controls. And again, just to remind you, uh, many of these patients um, uh, do not necessarily have, for instance, a low IQ. Uh, most of them uh, uh, end up uh, 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 having a, a normal lifespan, uh, um, but of course the impact, the burden of psychiatric disorders is very high. 
And so the next thing that we did is we started looking at the transcriptomic changes. And so, for instance, you can see this is the deletion region, the three megabase deletion. And, and as you may notice, most of the genes in that region are actually downregulated in neurons. And when we started looking at the, trans, uh, 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 the overall transcriptomic changes, uh, we found uh, probably uh, not as many genes as we thought we would find. Um, uh, uh, probably somewhere in in the few hundreds, uh, depending where you set the threshold. But uh, having such a large group of patients allowed us to do something which I think is very important uh, to do moving forward, which is estimate power. And um, this allowed us to actually estimate power that for detecting, uh, you know, with, with, with high power changes, even 15% differences in, in uh, gene expression changes across patients and controls, one would need uh, probably something close to about 30 lines or so, which I think it's, it's a very important point and, and something that should be uh, uh, discussed more and more in, in the field. Now, many of the genes that we found were differentially expressed were actually enriched uh, for previously associated uh, uh, schizophrenia genes, not autism or ADHD and not other psychiatric disorders. Interestingly, uh, schizophrenia, which is something we're pursuing. But when you start looking at what are these genes, uh, what are the cellular processes that these genes are related to, we notice that especially at later stages, after 75, close to 100 days, many of the genes were related to regulation of member potential, uh, calcium channels, just in general calcium activity. And so we thought, well, we should maybe see whether there is anything abnormal with calcium in the cells. And so we set up a, a, an assay, which we've been using for many years now, it, for this patient, in which you load the cells with the calcium dye, and then you depolarize them, and you look at the calcium rises uh, in the cells. And this is how these graphs will look like. So essentially, again, you record from the cells, and then at one point you depolarize them. There's a calcium influx, and of course, that's combined with an efflux as well. But you see there's a calcium uh, a rise, which will so slowly uh, 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 go down. And then one of the things that we found in, in this case, and this was like a very early phenotype, was that the patient cells actually had a decrease in the amplitude of the calcium rise, which was actually opposite of another disease that we've been studying. Uh, but we were not truly uh, convinced in just studying uh, a, a few patients. And so what we did is actually we looked across uh, many patients uh, and many, many cells. And you can see here both split by uh, patient and by line and the individual cells in this case. And you, as you can see, the phenotype is incredibly uh, uh, robust and very uh, clear. And there is almost a half uh, a decrease in the amplitude of the calcium rise. Now, we also wonder whether this actually improves with time. And it turns out that it does improve with time, but even after uh, 160, so half a year of culturing the cells in a dish, you can actually still see this decrease in the calcium amplitude. So it doesn't seem to be just a, 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 an early uh, maturation uh, uh, defect. We were not convinced to use just one single differentiation method, and we wanted to use another method um, to validate. So what we did is we implemented uh, uh, the cortical differentiation method in monolayer and derived cortical neurons, of course, primarily of deep layers in this case, because it's still like early in development, and did exactly the same experiment on another cohort of patients and another set of lines, and again, in monolayer cells, and we found precisely the same phenotype, which is, again, illustrated here across uh, several lines and patients, and it's shown here quantified. So that made us feel confident that this phenotype uh, may actually be robust. So we started thinking, well, what is actually causing this? The major, one of the major source of uh, uh, influx uh, in cells following depolarization and neurons following depolarization is actually through L-type calcium channels. So what we did is we um, uh, uh, performed this depolarization in the presence of a blocker of this L-type calcium channels. And we found that indeed the majority of the calcium influx was reduced by nimodipine. So very likely, this rise, not necessarily the phenotype, but the rise was mediated by an influx to l calcium channels. And in fact, sodium channels and other channels, for instance, MB, um, and NDA uh, 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 receptors, which are also permeable for calcium, were actually not, uh, did not seem to be responsible for this phenotype. So then we thought it's likely l calcium channels. So we undertook uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, characterization of l calcium channels in the cells. This is uh, work, uh, uh, heroic work done by uh, Omer Revach in the lab, who has uh, uh, patched now, uh, actually for the study, close to 500 neurons um, in the various instances uh, of this uh, paper together with uh, uh, 
other people in the lab as well. But interestingly, one of the first things that we noticed was that there was actually no change in uh, barium currents, nor were there any changes in calcium currents when you uh, look by patch clamping, which was rather surprising. Um, and, and moreover, actually, this phenotype was also not um, uh, dependent on uh, other cells because even uh, was cell intrinsic, because even if you were to mix cultures, this phenotype was still uh, present, which was uh, kind of interesting. So we thought, could it be that uh, um, if Elta calcium channels themselves are not uh, uh, changed, uh, their kinetic is not changed, could it be uh, that maybe uh, excitability of the cells that change and that is, is uh, changing? Uh, the dynamic of this uh, calcium influx through alpha calcium channels. And so uh, what uh, we started doing is uh, looking, uh, using cell attached uh, patch clamping uh, to look at excitability. And one of the interesting things, and this is uh, about 100 plus neurons that were patched, what we found both across multiple lines and across all the cells was a increase in excitability of the cells. Now, the action potential properties of the cells were uh, similar between patients and controls, but one parameter was consistently changed. And that was actually the resting member potential. And that was uh, a, quite a, sur a surprise for us. And again, uh, I, I, we were not really convinced until we patched uh, hundreds of neurons. And these are the results across like multiple lines and, and kind of like all the cells merged here. But you can see that while the control cells sit at around 52, 53 uh, millivolts, which is what uh, the developing human cortex, uh, 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 developing human cortical neurons uh, sit at, the patient cells uh, are actually slightly depolarized. Actually, this we can also see in monolayer um, uh, derived neurons. So it's not just the property of the 3D cultures. Um, and, and so we wonder how, whether this would actually be related to the calcium phenotype. So what we started uh, doing is a, a very uh, interesting experiment that Omer has been doing. It started uh, think, looking at the inactivation of this channel. So alpha calcium channels become inactivated by voltage. And so what we did is we uh, calculated inactivation curves uh, for uh, uh, both patients and controls um, by injecting currents um, uh, over time. And we didn't find any differences, as you can see here in the overall kinetic. But interestingly, if you start looking, for instance, at the resting member potential where, where either patients and control sit, um, so somewhere around like minus 50 and a little bit more depolarized, you can see that the fraction uh, of available channel is actually decreased in patients. Uh, and this is likely due to inactivation. To really show that we can induce this phenotype, what Omer has done is uh, uh, load the cells, patch the cell, load it with the calcium dye, and then while uh, imaging calcium in the cells, inject uh, a depolarizing current. And we've shown that the calcium uh, amplitude uh, was actually reduced by half in control cells if you were to first apply a pre-pulse that would bring the cells close to the depolarization, uh, uh, the level of depolarization that the patient cells, which again shows that what is likely happening here is that there is a defect in the resting membrane potential that is causing that calcium defect that I've shown you uh, before. And so again, like to put this in the broader context, what likely happens is there is a large deletion, uh, right? About uh, 30 to 60 genes, depending on the type of uh, 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 deletion that these patients carry, that is somehow causing changes in uh, transcriptional changes uh, affecting excitability, likely the resting member potential directly, which subsequently uh, uh, induce defects in voltage-gated calcium channel function. But what are the genes in the region that are responsible for this? And so we've actually been spending a lot of time hunting the gene in this region. And the way we've actually been doing this is primarily by genome engineering. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but I, because uh, 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 it would get a very, you know, it would get a very long story here. But what we've actually found is that uh, one gene in the region called DGCR8, which is a master regulator of microRNAs, um, was actually sufficient to induce this phenotype. So if you derive, for instance, isogenic, uh, an isogenic control line uh, from this patient, you can actually see that the DGCR8 isogenic line is uh, versus its uh, control, it uh, decreases in the calcium amplitude at pretty much the same level as the patient. Not only that, but even the excitability phenotype is recapitulated and more so the resting member potential phenotype. So essentially what we find is that this DGCR8 gene recapitulates most of the genes. Now. Um, can we restore these changes? And so what the MASIP has been doing is taking the GCR8 and delivering it with a virus in the cells and then looking back again. And what we find is um, uh, that uh, both in the isogenic line, uh, 
as well as in uh, patient, uh, uh, an actual patient lines, putting back DGCR8 restores the calcium uh, phenotype. It's not a full restoration, as you can see here. Um, and that obviously could depend on uh, uh, the timing and uh, uh, the dose of delivery. But it clearly shows that you can modulate with DGCR8 the uh, both ex, uh, both the levels of calcium entry following depolarization as well as and very interestingly uh, the resting member potential so um <clears throat> just uh, delivering dgcr8 or having the isogenic line is sufficient to change the resting member potential and um to put this in the, the broader context, what we think is happening is that DGCR8 uh, in the deletion region, probably together with other genes, it's, it's not clear whether this is the only gene, but it's clearly an important player. It's, uh, it's triggering a, a wave of changing in uh, genes associated with excitability that results in changes in the resting member potential. And those changing in the resting member potential are uh, uh, changing the inactivation, the levels of inactivation of l calcium channels would lead to that defect. Now, what I don't have time actually to show you today, because I, I do want to share um, some other work that we've been doing, is that we could also restore this pharmacologically uh, with uh, not just one antipsychotic, but actually with three antipsychotics that are known to also, uh, some of them are known to also work in patients. And the mechanism behind that is really interesting. Uh, and it actually has to do specifically with the restoration of the member potential. So I invite you to read the paper uh, in more details or, or write me if you're uh, interested in this. Now, we're not interested just in neurons. We're also interested in studying other cells. And this was primarily driven by uh, my mentor here, Stanford Ben Barris. Um, um, and uh, the, the, most of the work in my lab in Astrocyte has been done uh, early on by Stephen Sloan, who now has his own uh, uh, lab and what Stephen has shown very early on is that in the cultures, we don't have just neurons, but we also have a glial lineage that appears early on, but actually continues to mature over time. And you can see, for instance, here, the expression of some of these glial markers over time. You can see how this astrocyte looks. They're really uh, astro-like. So uh, 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 they uh, really have the star-like appearance, and then you can activate them uh, with serum in this case. This is how one of these astrocytes looks at later stages, so becoming rather uh, complex. Uh, and, and they're really scattered throughout the entire uh, 3D culture. Uh, and of course, they're functional because, for instance, you can feed them uh, synaptosomes and they're capable of engulfing them, for instance, and this is highly quantifiable and actually changes over time. But of course, you may wonder why we care so much about astrocytes. Of course, there are multiple reasons, but one of the most important reasons is that there is evidence, recent evidence, that there are uh, evolutionary changes in astrocytes. And this is, for instance, uh, in a classic uh, work uh, uh, published uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, showing that uh, rodent astrocytes and human astrocytes are very different in their morphology, not just in their size. Um, and this uh, their development uh, spends a much longer period of time, which again is another reason why uh, we should be thinking more about astrocytes because their development overlaps with the onset of many neuropsychiatric neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. So one of the first things that we uh, uh, sought to do, and this is what uh, uh, Stephen has done, is characterize over very long periods of time these cultures. And we wonder how far in development can we really go. And in this example, we, for instance, went to up to 600 days, but we know we can go for much longer uh, with the cultures. But here uh, we actually purified at, at all this time point, uh, both neurons and astrocytes. And Stephen has looked very carefully at the cells over time. And the most interesting thing that he found, which we later confirmed at multiple levels, Level, is that these astrocytes are changing over time. Very interestingly, initially they look like fetal astrocytes if you compare them to primary tissue, but at one point, and this happens actually sometimes around, we now know around 280 days or so, they start to switch to postnatal or postnatal signature. Um, and, and, and this is interesting because again, it does overlap with birth. In fact, uh, in uh, more recent work uh, done by uh, Aaron Gordon, which is still unpublished, We've shown, for instance, that even at the uh, DNA methylation level, we can actually predict the age of the so-called, if you want to call it, it's not really the age of birth, but the time of birth would occur with actually very high uh, 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 probability, which is, again, very exciting. But can you study the cells and their dynamic? If we can keep them for such a long time, can we actually study their dynamic over a long period of time? And so I don't have time to actually go into all the details. Um, but uh, one of the most uh, exciting directions that we've been uh, taken recently is looking at chromatin, dynamic chromatin changes over long periods of time in culture. Uh, and this was done uh, with wonderful collaborators here at Stanford, in particular, uh, Will Greenleaf's lab and Howard Chang, 
um, and Jonathan Pritchard. Um, and this work was driven uh, by Alex Trevino, Jimena Anderson, and NASA, you know, Armstrong, uh, who have been not just culturing the cells for a very long time, but actually purifying, extracting the cells and looking at, at dynamic. And of course, uh, this work was uh, published a, a, a few months ago, so I'm not going to go into details, but I do want to point out that there is a website, for instance, when you can check your gene of interest. And essentially what you have there is uh, uh, both dorsal and ventral pallium, both neuronal and glial cells, and you can look at both accessibility as well as RNA uh, uh, transcriptomic changes over uh, time. And one of the things, again, that we found here uh, to go back to the point before is when you start comparing it to primary tissue or even uh, all the epigenetic data sets that are available out there in the developing uh, and adult brain, you can see that while the cultures at early stages really resemble early fetal uh, stages, um, as they are approaching nine to 10 months of keeping them in the dish, they start to transition to a postnatal signature uh, and that actually continues uh, soon after birth. So that shows that both at the transcriptomic level as well as the epigenetic level, this transition does happen and speaks to probably some sort of intrinsic program uh, that is recapitulated in a dish. And indeed, what we found is uh, um, with using the system is that we could actually capture corticogenesis in all of its length uh, and identify a, a, a large change in uh, chromatin. Almost 25% of all chromatin changes happened between a very defined uh, period uh, that we called uh, cortico the corticogenesis wave. Uh, and most of it was driven by deep layer generation early and upper layer generation later. And you could actually use this opportunity, of course, especially for our interest in disease modeling, to start seeing where uh, disease variants uh, that are very often in non-coding parts of the region are actually mapping onto uh, developing cortex. Of course, you can do all kinds of other interesting things, for instance, looking at the dynamic changes uh, of some of these motifs over time, for instance, in astro sites, or more interestingly, look at even dynamic changes in uh, some of the known switches uh, in uh, 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 receptors. So for instance, the NMDH receptors, which are known to switch around birth from uh, 2B to 2A, is very interesting. We found that this switch uh, can happen, that we can actually see it, not just at the transcriptional level, but at the protein level. And then more recently with patch clamping done by Chris uh, uh, Mackinson, uh, over uh, uh, close to 500 days or so uh, in a dish, we've actually shown that this switch is also happening uh, in this culture, which is uh, really very exciting. Now, most of the work that I've shown you today is actually in generating very specific, uh, a, a specific brain region, which is the dorsal forebrain. And of course, our uh, 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 work has been, uh, in the last few years has been in trying not just to look at uh, one single brain region, but looking at interactions between uh, brain regions. And so almost four or five years ago, um, uh, uh, it, it, three very talented uh, postdocs uh, in the lab, um, uh, Fikri Bire, Jimena Anderson, uh, with help from uh, Chris Mackinson on the functional part, um, have uh, uh, tried to actually develop a platform that would allow us uh, to uh, derive very uh, specific brain regions and then assemble them. And so essentially the approach is like very straightforward and it just involves uh, providing small molecules separately in separate dishes uh, to find the right recipe to derive one brain region. So for instance, uh, for this work, uh, Fikri uh, Bire has primarily been uh, um, leading the derivation of these cultures and uh, the imaging has shown that you can actually um, uh, use various combination of small molecules to derive domains of the ventral forebrain, which I think are best illustrated through single cell gene expression that show that, well, in the dorsal forebrain, we, fair, we have primarily glutamatergic neurons. In the ventral forebrain, you have primarily uh, GABAergic neurons. Of course, you can characterize them uh, very carefully, show that they indeed are MG-derived. Uh, they're GABA uh, cells that have a, a, a diversity of uh, neurotransmitter identities. Um, and then as uh, Chris uh, has shown, you can actually patch them reliably uh, and, and detect not just firing, but actually uh, synaptic activity uh, as well. And this, most of the functional work was done with uh, by uh, Chris, which um, uh, actually is gonna open his own lab at Columbia uh, anytime now, um, uh, of course, pending the uh, pandemic. Uh, so what do you do with them? Uh, well, the approach that we introduce is a very straightforward approach where you actually take these two brain regions and what you do is you put them at the bottom of an epigenome tube uh, and you wait essentially for 24, 48 hours. And when you uh, come back and you look at them, you actually see that they have actually fused. So we call this preparation an assembloid because they're essentially assembled. Now, what this allows you to do is actually look inside over time and you can instance for C in making a dorsal and a ventral forebrain that most of the interneurons are on one side. Uh, these are interneurons labeled with a wonderful enhancer um, uh, uh, derived by uh, John um, 
Rubenstein at UCSF many years ago, which has been truly a blessing for most of this experiment. And if you start looking, for instance, uh, three, four weeks later, then you start seeing essentially an invasion of the dorsal forebrain part by these green cells, which in this case are uh, turn out to be interneurons. Now you can actually watch this live. So you can instance, for see all the interneurons have been labeled here, they're in white. This is the dorsal forebrain, which you can see is not labeled. But uh, what you can appreciate is that there is essentially an invasion of many of these interneurons that have moved into the dorsal forebrain. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they're not just of course, uh, moving, but they're moving in a peculiar way, which has been shown for many years, which is captured here in a more recent experiment at very high resolution uh, by uh, Fikri, who has uh, shown that similar to what happens in uh, rodents, uh, the cells have a leading branch, uh, right, uh, which is uh, showing the direction of movement uh, uh, that is followed uh, by uh, a very nice process of uh, uh, nucleokinesis. Uh, where the nucleus is actually pulled up um, and that process repeats. And it turns out that the cells are actually, of course, more larger because they're humans. But what is very interesting, they're not just much larger. Uh, it turns out that there are also some species specific differences in the ratio between the branches and the, uh, uh, then the nucleus, which I don't have time to show you. Now, we've also done a lot of functional characterization of the cells. We know that once they move, they do make a connection that most of the synaptic connections are now glutamatergic rather than being GABAergic. Um, and then we've shown that you can actually use it to model disease, specifically a form of autism called by a gain-of-function mutation in an l calcium channel. And we've shown, for instance, that if you were to look at the cells over time, very interestingly, patient-derived cells uh, that have a gain of function uh, in this channel engage more often in, uh, in uh, these migratory jumps or these migratory nucleokinesis processes, but they actually are left behind because they jump a shorter distance. Now, again, this is a gain of function mutation. So if you add a blocker of the cell calcium channels, obviously you get a, a stop in this migration. And this uh, was actually shown many years ago by Frank Poulou uh, in, in really a beautiful neuron paper uh, demonstrating the role of l calcium channels in interneural migration. But paradoxically, when you do this with patient cells, instead of seeing them stop in their uh, migration, they actually are rescued. Now, the reason why I think this is exciting is because I think this illustrates how you can actually use the cellular assay, um, uh, this unique aspect of human brain development, um, to start identifying phenotypes that would have been very difficult to identify uh, otherwise. And I think to a large extent, that's you know, like the promise of like some of this brain assemblage, uh, not just in um, uh, maybe looking at migration, but also at connectivity, as I want to briefly illustrate in the last part of my talk, um, and, and using, of course, a number of uh, techniques to do this. And so we've been developing many other brain regions um, and connecting them in various ways to try to build more complicated circuits. And I just want to highlight uh, very briefly here some work that is uh, unpublished uh, in trying to assemble a more complex brain circuit, uh, that, which is the corticospinal uh, muscle circuit. Um, and, um, and, and, and as you probably all know, cortical neurons in deep layers are projecting to the spinal cord, uh, connecting to neurons, um, in, including direct connections to motor neurons, it uh, turns out in primates, and those, those motor neurons can afterwards uh, control muscle contraction uh, at the neuromuscular uh, junction. And this work was uh, driven by uh, Jimena Anderson, uh, who really uh, was uh, very excited about building a system, of, uh, this system front part uh, in multiple steps. And so I just wanna guide you through uh, the steps that we take uh, to build the system. And there are actually four steps that Jimena is taking um, uh, to, towards this. And the first one was actually just to build a spinal cord organoid or, or, or a motor uh, uh, organoid. And I'm not gonna go into all the details, but Jimena has actually put a lot of effort into um, 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 changing uh, various uh, patterning molecules and cues over time. Uh, we settled on one of these conditions that is a little bit more rostral, but of course you can change some of that fate, more ventral, more dorsal. And you can see these beautiful three-dimensional cultures that have uh, markers, OLIC2 mar uh, and NKX2.2 uh, markers. Interestingly, there is some separation uh, also physically be between uh, this population of neurons, so some domains. Uh, they're also happening, obviously not as robust as you would see them in the core Cortex. But the surprise came when uh, um, Jimena did a single cell gene expression in these cultures. And we were surprised by the cell diversity. So motor neurons are actually this population right here, which are probably somewhere between 10 to 20%. But actually, there are many more uh, cells. There are V2A, there are V2B, there are V1, there are V0, and so on and so forth, progenitors and glial cells. And you can see, for instance, some of the markers. Um, and this is actually 
while the diversity is very high, what we found is that the differentiation is quite reliable. And I, uh, we've been doing differentiations in, in um, uh, almost nine lines now and show both by qPCR as well as by single cell gene expression that you can reproducibly generate the same population of uh, the cell diversity, uh, although uh, 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 you're do even if you're doing it from multiple lines. Now, inside, there are motor neurons. They're SMI32. They're cholinergic uh, neurons. You can even patch them using a reporter, an HB9 reporter. And they're not just neurons, but they're actually glial cells as well and astrocytes and oligodendrocytes actually form much earlier in this but we're, we're not going to focus on this so in, in, in step number two what Jimena has done is actually fuse these two preparations the dorsal and the ventral forebrain um, uh, the the uh, excuse me the the cortex and the spinal cord and very soon after you put them together you start seeing these projections that are going from the cortical side into the spinal part um, and if you start waiting for longer and it does take about a month or so what you see is are, are, are this large axonal projections that are coming from the cortex into spinal cord. Now, there are also projections vice versa, uh, but we're primarily focusing on this because we've primarily looked at the ventral uh, 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 spinal cord in, in this experiment. Now, in order to uh, uh, look more carefully, and we spend a lot of time actually on setting up some of these assays, we wanted to know who is projecting from the cortex. And so then uh, Jimena, together with uh, another postdoc in the lab, Yuki Miura, have been developing a, a Cree recombination uh, system uh, coupled with rabies uh, tracing that allows us to look back and see what cells are projecting. And I'm not going to go into the details, but what this experiment interestingly shown was that the cells that were projecting from the cortex more, were more likely to be expressing CT2 positive cells than an upper layer marker, showing that they are very likely uh, deep layer neurons, uh, presumably uh, spinal cord, uh, 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 cortical neurons projecting to the spinal cord, but of course uh, that is, is, is a little bit more difficult to def definitively uh, demonstrate. Uh, now, of course, their cortical neurons are projecting, but are they really functional? And so um, we've been setting up uh, this preparation where you can actually do calcium imaging in the spinal cord and then stimulate optogenetically uh, the cortex. And for instance, you can see here that you can record uh, uh, from uh, this uh, uh, spinal cord neurons and then shine light on the cortex. And as you can see, one of these uh, neurons in the spinal cord uh, starts uh, responding. This is quite uh, reliable and can be blocked uh, by uh, glutamatergic blockers. But then what uh, Omer in the lab has actually done is, is uh, uh, do this very difficult uh, uh, recordings, patch clamp recordings in slices, who are optogenetically stimulating and recording from uh, motor neurons. And has actually shown in a few instances, this is not a very common event, but we've shown in a few instances that you can actually trigger uh, a postsynaptic uh, current change in a motor neuron that you're recording by, uh, by optogenetically stimulating the cortex. And that is actually uh, blocked by TTX, which we think is, is very exciting. So uh, uh, in the next step, uh, what we wanted to know is whether the spinal cord is really functional. So what we did is we uh, dissected the mouse limb bud at E11.5 and then uh, attach it to the human spinal cord. And when you do this, you can actually see that the, uh, the mouse limb bud is capable of actually uh, doing this light twitches, which we know are uh, mediated by cholinergic transmission because if you use, use curare, that is actually uh, uh, gone. And then lastly, we wanted to know whether we could build this with uh, uh, with human muscle. And so Jimena has been optimizing a series of protocols, both with human myoblast as well as with like IPS derived uh, uh, muscle, and then essentially uh, derive a 3D aggregate of human muscle that you can attach to the spinal cord organoid. And as you can see soon after you attach them, and this happens much faster also than the cortex, you see this uh, uh, projection from the spinal cord into the uh, uh, into the muscle. Uh, you can see here the muscle fiber, desmin positive. You see some barrier toxin uh, positive puncta on the surface as well. And then if you use the same rabies tracing approach, uh, interestingly, what we found is that although motor neurons are just maybe about 10 to 20% of all the cells, 90% of the cells that are projecting to the muscle are actually motor neurons, which again speaks to some level of specificity that is possible in the system despite very minimal cues. And now this is how muscle cells look alone. And then once you start putting the spinal uh, uh, neurons on top of them, they start flickering. So then in the last uh, step, and this is, uh, I'm wrapping up now, what you actually can do is you can try to put all three together. So again, just to recap, you can derive a cortical, a cortical uh, a spheroid or cortical organoid. Um, you can derive separately a spinal cord organoid and separately a muscle uh, a 3D culture, either from mouse, myoblast, or from IPS-derived muscle. 
and then you can put them together. And what you get is this large structure uh, that we call that we call a cortical motor or a cortical spinal muscle assembloid. It's relatively large. Um, uh, you can see here, this is a well of a six well plate, and this is how large the structure is. Surprisingly, actually, Jimena demonstrated that you can keep them for quite a long time, up to 10 weeks or so after you have fused them, uh, which is actually quite a long time. But interestingly, this skeletal muscles, they're not cardiac muscles, so they're not gonna contract spontaneously. So you have very little activity happening um, uh, on their own. But once you actually uh, uh, put them in an assembloid, then we notice that the muscle um, uh, displays this twitches, which you can actually see, for instance, here, uh, right? The spinal cord is really on the side, and then the muscle displays this twitching, which is very exciting. Now, to really be able to um, demonstrate that the circuit uh, um, uh, is functional, we think that optogenetic and, and manipulation of the circuit is really important. Um, so uh, what we've been doing is actually uh, uh, put a, an opsin into the cortex uh, before fusion and then fuse all three and then image the muscle part, the skeletal muscle, which can be seen actually here on the lower part. Now, this preparation is actually quite large. So very often our fields of view are not allowing us to see the entire preparation. So you're gonna have to believe me that uh, the spinal cord is really on this side and then even farther up, there is a cortex and the cortex has again the opsin and you can do this with various opsins but uh, in this case uh, is a red uh, shifted opsin where you can actually shine a light only on that part or you can shine it on the entire uh, preparation and then you will see that the, the this is a video the video will go uh, black and it will stay stim and so uh, when you do this as you will see um, when you when you shine the light you can actually see this contraction uh, which of course happens um, uh, quite reliably almost every single time you shine light, which I, I think is an important uh, component of demonstrating uh, that this circuit is functional. Moreover, it's actually glutamatergic mediated because if you, for instance, use MPQX or APV, you can completely block it. And we've done a lot of controls for this, uh, just stimulating various parts and uh, making sure that it's not just light derived. In fact, we've also implemented glutamate uncaging in the system, uh, which has not really been implemented before with, with human neurons and shown that you can also use glutamate uncaging and uncaged glutamate in the spinal cord or the cortex to see very similar um, uh, approaches. And there are a number of applications that are ongoing, very exciting applications that are ongoing for the system. Uh, but we now know that since we can keep them for very long periods of time, we can now look at um, um, ultra structural changes in the cells. For instance, you can see here uh, some of the synaptic vesicles or some of the muscles over long term in cultures. You can also appreciate, for instance, here uh, that uh, some of this uh, muscle, uh, some of this like uh, neuronal bundles uh, coming from the cortex into the spinal cord start to be wrapped up by MBP positive cells, which is a very uh, interesting application. Um, uh, you can see, for instance, here as well on the other side. And interestingly enough, um, we've uh, noticed very recently that this there are some dynamic changes over time in these cultures. And if you keep them uh, for longer, um, the amplitude of the calcium response following stimulation seems to be changing over time, which is not to speak that there is necessarily a plasticity to it, but there are definitely some dynamic changes happening in these cultures, um, uh, which we think are uh, very exciting. And so with this, I, I really actually want to wrap up and, and go back actually to kind of like uh, a, a similar slide with the first slide that I have, where I, I hope I convince you that uh, using uh, uh, both human IPS derived as well as primary tissue, uh, uh, brain tissue, uh, you can start asking questions, not just about patterning and cell specification, which of course is very important, but also about maturation by maintaining the cells for very long periods of time um, while doing this in uh, with, with an eye on reproducibility and uh, reliability, which is very important in modeling disease. Uh, that you can actually look very systematically by imaging and electrophysiology at uh, uh, changes in the cells, uh, both over time, but as well in patients versus control, as I've illustrated in the case of 22Q11 deletion. But then if you want to look at cell-cell interactions, then you can use an assemblyed approach where you can derive them separately, uh, put them together, and start looking both at migration, as well as, as I've shown in the case of spinal cord, derive differently, different regions separately, and then put them together um, to uh, look at axon pathfinding. And of course, another very exciting area, which I, I haven't, uh, I don't have the time to actually uh, cover today, is actually starting to look at circuit refinement and plasticity, which uh, we think it's a very exciting direction and actually can be done by doing some uh, uh, transplantation experiments in uh, animals. But I think maybe uh, that uh, I'll leave that for another time. And with this, I want to
uh, acknowledge my really amazing uh, group at, at Stanford shown here uh, when we did not have to socially distance uh, a few uh, a couple of years ago and uh, the uh, really incredible sources of funding that I've been uh, uh, having over the years here at Stanford uh, both from the Neurostensile Foundation, the Chen Zuckerberg Foundation, the Neuroscience Institute, the uh, NIH of course uh, which has been a really a major funder for the lab and I also want to mention that we've been doing uh you know we've been we've been trying to share the technology and make sure that uh as many people uh that are interested in this technology can implement them successfully so a year ago we started running this uh, intense like one week uh, hands-on workshop here at stanford in our new uh, uh, uh woodside neuroscience building where the human brain organogenesis uh, uh program uh resides and we've had the chance to really bring 20 amazing students uh, from four continents and uh, together as a lab uh, teach them most of the not just the differentiation but many of the assays which we think are very important and shown for instance here are many of the students uh, uh, during the lecture time or like doing experiments in the lab or at the end at the graduation so we're, we hope to have a similar workshop done uh, again so soon in some format and so for those interested uh, i would highly recommend you to apply and lastly i want to mention that uh, uh, for those who are interested in this field moving forward, that we have a really exciting uh, meeting on human brain organoids, uh, which uh, started, I started maybe, you know, uh, 2017 or so at Cold Spring Harbor. And I had really the pleasure of leading with uh, Paola and uh, now with uh, Guo Li, uh, both in last year edition and 2021. It's really an amazing meeting. The, the group uh, uh, that we have there has uh, uh, gone from 100 to over 200 people now. And so it's a really exciting time. And with that, I would like to um, uh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to questions. And for those of you who are interested in coming to Stanford uh, and uh, doing a, a postdoc, um uh here or like you want to come to graduate school here uh feel free to uh contact me um thank you very much thanks a lot sergio thanks a lot um for this very broad and yet very detailed uh, overview of how uh, in vitro approaches can help us better understand the normal and abnormal in development, you're not hearing the the claps, but you're going to see them sc uh, scroll down to the right of your screen. I, I've seen some comments pass by, and uh, I think it was very much appreciated. So now is the time for for the questions. Uh, I'm going to read them to you. People have had the opportunity to vote uh, on which one they they were also interested in. So so I'll start. Um, in the in the three-part cortical motor assemblies, do cortical spinal neurons sometimes directly project to the muscle? Uh, so I guess this addresses the specificity of the projection. And does the spinal organoid have to be between the cortical and the muscle organoid? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, and actually, we have done that experiment, and we know that um, uh, cortical neurons are not there, there's very little projection into the muscle. That is happening. We we know there's actually quite a lot of specificity in many of these fusions. Um, so, for instance, even for the ventral and dorsal forebrain, if you put two ventral forebrain spheroids, there's very little migration actually happening. So, some of those cues are obviously present uh, uh, there, and and similar here as well. Um, the uh, fusion to the muscle, it's it's actually not uh, uh, that useful. Uh, you don't really get like a functional preparation. Uh, and uh, the same like regarding to the question whether they're projecting all the way, um, you know, I, I don't think we've seen like projections that are going like all the way to the muscle. Um, mm -hmm. What we have seen actually, and I think I haven't shown, is that I think I've shown in the beginning, but we noticed that there are domains of uh, spinal motor neurons. So the motor neurons, which again are just 20% or so of the, all the cells, tend to be in clusters. And what we notice is that very often the projections from the cortex tend to go towards those clusters. Uh, mm -hmm. Which again speaks to the fact that there are probably some local cues uh, that we may be able to, um, you know, I guess with time, you know, deconstruct. Um, <laughs> The muscle is in between the cortex and the spinal cord. Would the corticospinal axons traverse the muscle without synapsing, then contact I, the target, and then loop back? For the I, I, I don't think that would be possible. No, I, I think that would not. Not the, the projections will like not go probably through it. I okay. would say. 
another question, which aspects of the 22Q11 phenotype did you need 3D organoid preparations for? Could all of this have been identified using traditional 2D approaches? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, yes, the question is, you could have identified this phenotype with 2D and um, uh, with 2D cultures. The, advantage actually of 3D cultures here, and I don't know whether that's surprising or not, is actually has been scalability. So we we, we, we know actually that three-dimensional differentiations now are much more scalable uh, than 2D cultures. And so we were able, that, that's the way we've actually been able to do, um, you know, 45 uh, plus lines over long periods of time. Uh, mm -hmm. It also allowed you to, it also allowed us, for instance, to show that the phenotype is not transient. Right? Because they're very often people have been describing all kinds of phenotypes in IPS models where they're looking maybe at like 20, 30 days after differentiation, really, really early stages. And uh, many of those changes we have also find in other, so that they're actually disappearing. They're just like transitory changes. Maybe they're line to line variability. And so actually having a large number of lines and being able to look over time, including it like after six months, which would be very difficult with monolayer cultures uh, is possible. But the actual phenotype, Absolutely. And in fact, in the lab, we use, you know, very often both 2D and 3D approach. We very often ask ourselves, you know, could this have been done in 2D? Do you really need to do go in 3D? Because very often some assays are much more straightforward to do in 2D. You feel like the 3D uh, context is renders the detection of a phenotype uh, more sen more sensitive, like the cells are in a more natural environment, hence you would be able to detect more subtle def yeah. defects? Well, I, I think it depends on the phenotype. Uh, I think if it's, uh, uh, I don't know, if it's maybe about axon guidance, uh, then maybe uh, the 3D environment maybe, you know, would help. And I think there has been some recent work that shows that that matters. But when it comes to intrinsic excitability, for instance, in this case where we show that even if you mix the patient that controls, it doesn't really matter. Um, um, now, one aspect that I, I think is unique and is not part of actually this work of 22Q11 is that uh, astrocytes in the 3D cultures uh, are non-reactive and they appear much later. And we know they're more capable of inducing, for instance, synaptogenesis at later stages than at early stages. And that you can only do in 3D cultures. And so, for instance, it remains to be seen what happens once astrocytes uh, show up at much later stages and whether they can either rescue or, or modulate this phenotype. Sure, yeah. Uh, great presentation. Do the organoid models okay. consider the gender of the donor, subject, patient? If they do, have you find differences between genders? Very, very good question. Um, so we, tr so in most of, especially in the 22Q11 work, uh, actually gender, uh, well, more correctly, I would say sex, is part of the, uh, is, is part actually of our regression model for looking at gene expression changes, right? Because there are both changes in the X chromosome, for instance, and I'm sure many of you work with iPS cells know there are all kinds of issues with X chromosome inactivation during this differentiation. So those actually have to be looked at like very carefully. Um, in the case of 22Q11, we have not actually seen differences between genders. So actually um, the contribution of, well, has been actually quite minimal. Um, but you know, it remains to be seen, for instance, if for some environmental changes, there are actually sex related differences, right? So we do know uh, that, uh, you know, uh, sex is one of the predictors, right? For outcomes in uh, early neurodevelopmental injury, be it genetic, uh, or environmental, but that has not really been studied uh, systematically. All right, uh, one question regarding the, the first part on the hypoxia, any hypothesis on why the intermediate progenitors would be particularly uh, susceptible? Um, well, again, like a really great question. Uh, I, I don't think we have a definitive answer. It, uh, one possibility is that, and this is very well known, is that uh, intermediate progenitors, especially the subventricular zone, which of course in humans is, is greatly uh, expanded, um, is, uh, is highly vascularized. And so the cells are actually very close to blood vessels all the time. So it could be their proliferation or just their uh, development is, and I think there is a lot of evidence for actually for that in the mouse as well, is much more dependent on oxygen level. But, uh, um, but what, for instance, makes them most susceptible to turning on the unfolded protein response, uh, that still remains, which is also physiological, as, as people have shown. It's just that in this case, it's obviously pushed uh, too far 
and uh, it's essentially inducing an exit from the cell cycle, which in this case actually, and I haven't shown, is mediated probably through P27. Um, okay. Uh, great talk. I have a couple of questions. What do you think other cell types, such as blood vessel cells, could influence uh, the neural differentiation organo organoids? And second question, besides of disease modeling, what do you think the future of using organoids uh, let me finish this and yeah, well, I guess, sorry, I'll, re I'll rephrase that in a more compact way. So the first thing is what's the role of um, non-neuronal cell and in particular blood vessels uh, in yeah. disease? You kind of answered to this in the previous question. And um, what's your maybe broader philosophical or medical view on how realistic it would be to use uh, approaches such as the one you are developing for, for, for patients? Right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, even like related to the first question, I, I, absolutely. I mean, it could very well be that not just vascularization, but endothelial cells themselves may be providing, you know, various cues that are important. So I, I think that absolutely needs to be done. I think to a large extent, and I think very often there is a little bit of confusion in the field um, that, oh, you could also have this and you could also add that, right? Like what is the role of microglia? What is the role of mesoderm? Uh, I, I think it really depends a little bit on the question that you want to answer. Right, and uh, I think the advantage of an in vitro system is uh, uh, precisely that you can build it from parts, and you can keep it relatively simple or make it more complex. Um, uh, three dimensions really bring another level of complexity, uh, obviously, to the preparation. So we've usually been erring on like less complexity, so that we can actually tackle questions systematically. But um, you know. One way to get vascularization is actually by transplantation. That's a great way of getting vascularization, functional vascularization that you can actually study in vivo. Um, and in terms of like, I guess the longer term vision, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I see this as essentially like another tool in the arsenal of methods that we have to study human brain development and, and not just human brain development in a way, but also human brain evolution, right? There's, uh, there has been already really beautiful work trying to compare various uh, species right of primates in their properties and trying to understand what makes us unique, uh, which is obviously would be very difficult to do, especially, uh, for instance, with uh, in, in chimpanzees. Uh, uh, and uh, But at the end of the day, uh, this is just a tool. And I think uh, one has to decide very carefully uh, what part, what aspect of it and what tool to use when asking a question. And it's not uncommon for us as well that we can move from like a 2D system to a 3D system. Uh, sometimes we use an assemblage, sometimes we use mouse model. Um, sometimes you may want to use a ferret model or a primate model. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, it's the question that is the most important. All right. Um, there's a couple of other questions, but uh, I feel they're a bit more technical. So please do free to, to contact Sergio if, if you want to know yeah. more about some specific aspects. There's also some uh, nature protocols in particular uh, papers that are available from his website. Sergio, um, thank you so much for uh, this very nice presentation and taking the time to address the questions. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. To everyone, uh, we're uh, reaching the summer break, so for the next month, um, nothing is happening on worldwide neural development, but I guess, I hope, a lot of good things will be happening for you guys. Uh, if you can, get some rest, and we'll see each other uh, in uh, September. It will be uh, Claire, Claire Villard from uh, the Paris Brain Institute. So take care, everyone, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.